What's up, everyone? This is my third podcast with Ernesto Estrada. And we will talk about social balance, conflicts, world wars, tribes in Papua New Guinea, um, how triangles help analyze Hollywood and Netflix divorces. And we have appearances ranging from Brad Pitt to Jennifer Aniston. We talk about linear algebra, the power of matrices, and network theory and network science. Enjoy. So you studied the social balance theory, like in a, in, from a mathematical perspective. And um, as you know, I'm also in social sciences. Um, yeah, can you elaborate on that? Because I found it quite interesting because it penetrates sort of all kinds of things. For example, psychology. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> we were talking about African agriculture. Now we move to a completely different scenario. Wow. But uh, this is this is the the the, the interesting things of, of doing mathematics. Um, yeah, so what, what is the social balance and how this uh, theory started? So it was in the 1940s. So it's, a, it's an old uh, sociological theory. It was introduced by Heider, uh, uh, particularly for analyzing small groups. So what he observed is the kind of uh, relations that people have in, in small social groups. So if you have a small social group, uh, doing a task, for instance, in a meeting, in a company, or in a school, uh, kids, or whatever. Uh, so you have some people that cooperate easily between them, but there are other people that uh, avoid to cooperate. So you have two kinds of uh, social ties there. So uh, let's say that some of them are positive, cooperation, friendship, and some of them are negative, so non-cooperation or enmity, and so forth. And then he observed uh, two important things uh, in small social groups. The first was that certain systems were more, let's say, stable, use this uh, imported word from, from physics, and other were more unstable. And then he observed that, of course, if all the social relations were positive, so the system was stable in the way that it worked perfectly, and there were no tensions there, the social ties were negative, uh, the system was very unstable, and uh, that people tended to, to go all apart. And this is, these are two trivial cases. So the, the non-trivial cases is when you have mix of positive and negative relations. So now let's say that you have uh, two negative relations and one positive relation in a triangle, okay? So I will put the triangle here, and I will have these two uh, social relations are negative, and this social relation here is positive. So then it means that these two guys are friends, and this guy is an enemy of these two friends. So what Heider observed is that although the number of negative relations is larger than the number of positive relations, this system is stable. So this corresponds to the case when you say, okay, if the enemy of my enemy is my friend, then I can form an alliance. The two friends can form an alliance. The two, the, so the enemy is simply put apart from this group. So I can split this into friends and enemies, enemies in, a, in a very easy way that the system is somehow stable. So the situation was different if you have two positive edge and one negative edge. So in this case, I have these two relations are positive and this one is negative. And then suppose that uh, this unfortunately happened when, uh, for instance, uh, uh, husband and wife uh, with a common friend, husband and wife divorce, okay? So now they continue having the same friendship, but now they have enmity. Well, in some cases, they have enmity between husband and wife, okay? But the situation for this friend is very difficult because this guy is telling this that her former wife was a very bad person. And she was telling the friend that her former husband was, uh, is a very bad guy. So then there is a tension in the system and the system is not stable. So let's first of all define social balance. Um, and so here's my attempt to define social balance. <laughs> So hopefully you recognize these people, Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. And so suppose that you happen to be friends, you know, that you hang out in Hollywood, so you're friends with Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston. 
And two years ago, they were a married couple, so they had a friendly link between them. And if you were friendly with both of them, there is a triad of relationships in which you have friendly relations, or you can think of them as ferromagnetic bonds, and everybody is pointing in the same state. They all like each other. And so this triad, or this triangle, is unfrustrated, or in the social parlance, it's called balanced. Then what happened, we all know what happened, they divorced each other. And at this stage of the game, if you still are friends with Brad and Jen, then you go over to Brad's house and he says, you know, that Jen is such a bitch and I can't stand her. And then you go and visit Jen and he says, well, that Brad is such a, you know, whatever, I can't stand him. And, you know, you go, if you try and maintain your relationships with both members of the divorced couple, you just can't stand it because you're, they're always bad-mouthing each other to, to you. And so what often happens, and it's sort of painful, is that you have to break relationships with one of them. And so in this particular example, you've decided, well, I won't be friends with Jen anymore. I can now be friends with Brad. And so now the two of you can both badmouth Jen. This triangle is now balanced. So the system uh, end up, according to the observation of Heider in 1948 and consequent years, to be transformed into stable situation, into a balanced situation. So maybe the husband and, and the former friend break relations because he see, okay, so he's more now in favor of my former wife. Now we have two negative and one positive edge. The system is balanced and the system is stable. Now I have a coalition of uh, wife and friend against the husband. So this was the situation and, and then in the 1940s and 1950s, mainly in the 1950s, uh, there were a lot of empirical evidence for um, small groups that these two situations were uh, almost always observed. So first, balanced systems are more stable and unbalanced systems tend to be balanced with time. So there were a mathematician that was very famous uh, in the 20th century and it was Frank Harari. And uh, he is uh, the, the, one of the modern fathers of uh, let's say, graph theory and the application across the disciplines. And one of the main um, areas of interest for him was uh, social science. Also anthropology, for instance, and physics and chemistry and so forth. But then he joined forces with Carl Wright, who was a sociologist with great background in mathematics. And they simply realized what you have here are something that mathematicians call sign graphs. So a sign network is a network in which you simply put uh, positive or negative signs to the edges. Now, if you have the case, uh, husband, wife, and uh, friend, you have a negative sign and two positive signs there. And they simply realize that a system, let's put a triangle, a triangle is balanced if and only if the product of the signs is positive. Mm -hmm. If the product of the signs is positive, you have a balanced system. If the product of the signs is negative, you have unbalanced system. So when the enemy of your enemy is my friend, you have negative, time negative is positive, time positive is positive. So this is a balanced system. When you have the husband, wife, and friend, you have negative, time positive is negative, time positive is negative, and this is an unbalanced system. Of course, the two trivial cases that we analyze it, one is totally positive and the other is totally negative, so the products are positive and negative. So they elaborated a few mathematical theorems, which are very interesting. Uh, one of them uh, is the structural balance theorem. Structural balance, as far as I can tell, was uh, first sort of a term coined by the late strength coach Charles Poliquin. And basically what it relates to is different ratios of strength between different muscle groups, and the idea that there's sort of an optimal balance point there, where if we can achieve it, our body works best in this sort of synergy of awesomeness. You like to watch series on Netflix. So you have a positive relationship. And you also like an actor, which plays in a series. Um, this actor, let's call him K Spacey. And uh, the series is very um, successful um, on Netflix. So they, as a business partners, they definitely have a positive relationship and everything is fine. So that is balanced because plus times plus times plus 
is plus. You could also write plus one times plus one times plus one is plus one. So that is imbalanced. Okay. So now let's remove this here. So let's assume there's a scandal um, and K Spacey has a big scandal and Netflix on Netflix, they cannot really support um, Sirius with K Spacey anymore. So that would change this here, this relationship to negative. And now if it would stay like that, um, you would have an, an unbalanced uh, relationship network, an unbalanced network, because um, you have plus times plus times minus, that is negative. Okay, and, um, but you, you have a desire to have balance. So what you would do is either you change your attitude towards Netflix and there's not so much reason to do so. Um, there's maybe more reason to change the attitude uh, towards like uh, K Spacey. So and that, that most likely will happen in that case here. And you, you just switch to a negative attitude because you also don't like the things which um, have been involved with the scandal. So, and if you do that, then you, you transform this uh, relationship here to something stable because minus times minus times plus is plus. And that means that um, this relationship here um, would be stable according to Heider. They say that a network is balanced if all the cycles are balanced. So if all the cycles in that network are balanced, then the network as a whole is balanced. So if uh, uh, you don't need to check all of the other things by checking only the balance across the cycles, you can say whether the network is balanced or is not balanced. Yeah, so th that, is, that is a very strong statement because that, that gives you a statement about global stability with a local measure, right? So that is strong. Exactly. And their strongest theorem is that if the network is balanced, you can split the network into two groups. Let's call group A and group B. Mm -hmm. And this split is in the following way. If the network is balanced, all the relations, all the connections inside the group A and inside the group B are positive. And all the relations between group A and group B are negative. It doesn't mean that all the people in the group A, a has relation between them. No, 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 no. It could be three nodes or five nodes, three of them have connections, but all of these connections are positive. The same in group B. It doesn't mean that all the nodes, all the people in the group A have relation with the group B, but those that have relation between A and B have negative relations in the case of the balanced uh, network. In the case of the uh, unbalanced network, you don't have this split into two uh, categories. So um, the mathematicians always are interested first in the yes, no question. So the yes, no question is, is this network balanced? Yes or not? Yes, okay, so I can split there, I can tell you something interesting. No, okay, I'm not very much interested in this one. But then uh, from time to time, particularly in the, in the application areas, the point, the question which is interesting is how balanced is this unbalanced network? So it's a quantification, it's a gray scale. It's going out from the black or white and to have one scale of uh, values that tell you, okay, this is closer to balance. It's not balanced, but it's closer to balance than this one and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the can I ask something? So if you have a um, not small, like a big um, network, which is uh, uh, unbalanced, um, then according to the theory, it's not possible if you change one single link that, that it becomes balanced. Is that a consequence? Or maybe, maybe um, I cannot wait for that, but maybe that is also a way to measure how imbalanced um, uh, a network is, how many single things you have to change um yeah oh, but so this is exactly this is exactly what i was uh well I'm, I'm okay what it's about but the first the first idea was from was from harari so uh and then uh, and then he counted this uh a number what exactly what you say how many edges i have to remove to become the network uh balance and this is a very bad solution okay <laughs> it's a very bad solution <laughs> It typically goes to NP complete problems. So it happens if you try to split the network into bipartitions and, and then you try to say, okay, how many 
uh, edges I have to remove in order to become the network bipartite. So, uh, so the first thing is, okay, so I have to know what is the best, uh, let's say, the best partition that uh, avoid nodes connected inside the groups which are non-positive or between the group which are non-negative. Mm -hmm. So you have to make this partition in order to say, okay, I have to remove this and this and that. So uh, then there was a big silence, particularly away from the discrete mathematics uh, uh, area. In, in discrete mathematics, people continue finding uh, theorems for balance systems and modifying the concept of balance, etc. until the boom of network theory started at the beginning of the 21st century. And uh, then the, the many people discovered balance and, and they asked the question, okay, how the networks that we have around, the new kind of networks are balanced or imbalanced. Let me put you uh, two or three examples. The first sample is for instance, <clears throat> do you have now recommendation systems in internet? One of them are for instance, uh, uh, film recommendations. So now you have that if you and I recommend the same film, we say that the same uh, film is uh, a nice film, you and I has agreement. So we have a positive connection between you and I. But then if you and I, and this can be analyzed by probability, by frequency, etc. So if you and I always say that the same film is good or bad, we agree and then we have a positive you can say 60% or whatever. But if you and I disagree and, uh, in recommending one film or a book or whatever, a food, then you and I have a negative, uh, a negative time. So this is one signed network. And then you can have millions of recommenders. So we, we go away from this small group that people in the 50s were analyzing, that there were no more than 20 people to now 100,000 people or million people. And uh, another is, for instance, the, the voting for Wikipedia uh, administrators. So you know that Wikipedia is almost self-organized, but there are administrators for the different topics. And the people vote for the administrators. And uh, what happens is that if you and I vote for the same, well, you and I have a positive connection. If you and I vote against, uh, or in different ways for different administrators, you and I have a different connection. So these are two examples of, uh, of social, uh, online social networks with signs, and they are big kind of networks. So people investigated this, and uh, now we have a problem. And the problem is a computational problem. So if you want to analyze all the cycles, you have to find all the cycles in these networks. And this is a very complicated, very, very complicated stuff. So let's start with cycle detection. This is actually a warm up for topological sort. So does my graph have any cycles? G has a cycle. I claim this happens if and only if G has a back edge. Or let's say a depth first search of that graph has a back edge. So it doesn't matter where I start from or you know, how this algorithm, I run this top level DFS algorithm, explore the whole graph, because I want to know in the whole graph, is there a cycle? I claim if there's a back edge, then there's a cycle. Cool. So it all comes down to back edges. This will work for both directed and undirected graphs. Detecting cycles is pretty easy in undirected graphs. It's a little more subtle with directed graphs, because you have to worry about the edge directions. So let's prove this. from a computational point of view. So what is the best solution is to go to a simple, clear, 
and wrong solution. Let's say, for instance, let's go to analyze only the triangles. Okay, so the triangles are in the proper heart of the Heider theory, initial theory. But suppose that there is a social network, very strange social network without triangles. But it's a sign graph, it's a sign and network. What can you say? Well, my method cannot tell you anything. However, I can see that there are some squares that can split into two parts because I have two positive relations connected by two negative relations, so it's balanced. But there are no triangles. Well, people analyze this uh, in this way, and uh, they found that the networks were very balanced. So it was agreement with Heider theory, and it was published in top journals. And uh, in the meantime, uh, an author, uh, Italian author, Altafini, did a very, very clever and important thing. And he said, okay, so let me see what happened if I have a dynamical process on top of this sign graph. And this dynamical process it, is very simple. It's a consensus dynamic. Mm -hmm. What is a consensus dynamic? A consensus dynamic is a dynamic in which we have the predisposition to make an agreement, to have a consensus, but we discuss. Suppose that we are discussing about the length of this interview, uh, but we have to discuss with your wife, with your kids, the same for me and so forth. So first of all, we discuss and we say, okay, uh, okay, Jan, uh, two hours could be okay. But then you discuss with your wife and your wife will say, no, one hour and a half. So you make an agreement and you have to update your agreement with me because I have now another proposal, two hour and a half. So we have to make an agreement. So you do this and you can guarantee that there, there is a collapse to an stable state in which the solution is the average of all the initial conditions that we have. So this is in the case in which we don't have positive and negative relations. Okay, so I was mentioning just everybody has a positive cooperative situation. Now, when you have positive and negative situation with Altafini uh, proof analytically is that if the network is balance, you have something that he called a compromise uh, agreement, a compromise consensus. And this compromise consensus depends on this split of the network into these two consensus uh, uh, groups. So you, have, you can have a consensus in this group, a consensus in this group, but a dissensus between the two groups. This is what happened in parliaments. The Democrats and the Republicans, they have agreement inside, agreement inside, but disagreement. So what is this? It's a new state for the network. It's not a global consensus. You have two states which are stable of consensus. But from a mathematical point of view, this was telling a hidden message. And the hidden message was that it was completely necessary to take into account all the subgraphs, all the substructures which were inside your network. Of course, we have the theorem that you don't need all the substructures, you need only the cycles. But then you need all of them, not necessarily only the triangles. And at this point, I enter into the play because I knew two things. One thing was a theorem proof by an Indian mathematician in 1981, which is beautiful. And it's the following. So if you have a network, whatever network, which is balanced, and then you reproduce this network exactly in the same way, but just swapping all the negative edges to positive, so you become the network into all the, net, all the edges positive, if you compare one particular property, which is the spectrum of the spectra of these two networks, which is the set of eigenvalues together with their multiplicity of the adjacent symmetry of both networks, he proved that they are identical. But wait, so you said like you, 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 you change all negative to positive, but that means they are only positive in the entire network. Only positive, yes. 
So, so they are you also say you, you override all edge weights with plus. So that is equivalent. E equivalent to that, exactly. You yeah. take the absolute of the JSON symmetry. And then yeah. mm -hmm. in the case that you have balance, you have this identity between the spectrum of the two. And this is an if and only if. So if there is only one edge breaking the balance, the spectrum is different. This is one thing I knew. The second thing I knew is that I can count all the cycles without counting any cycle. And this is how I much spend all my career, is by using algebraic network theory to do combinatorial things. And this is one of the most beautiful things in mathematics, when you have something in one area connected to something in another area. So for instance, if you take one six of the third power of the sum of the third power of all the eigenvalues of the adjacent symmetry of any network, you are counting triangles. What? 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 You are taking eigenvalues. I know that. So one six to the power you raise all eigenvalues to the power of one over six. You take you take every eigenvalue. You take the q of these eigenvalues. Yeah. You sum all of them. Yes. All the cubes of these eigenvalues. Yes. And you divide it by six. Ah, okay. And you uh, the number of triangles. So the signs, uh, they are the same. You don't kill the signs of the eigenvalues. Yeah, in the case of you have all the signs the same. In other case, you are counting on the signs of the... But okay, but let me, let me put to, this into context. Mm -hmm. These eigenvalues are real numbers. Okay? Because in the case of the metric is metric. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? So you take a real number, you rise it to the cube, you sum, okay, this is a real number. Yes. Then you sum many different real numbers, you divide it by six, you obtain an integer. And this integer is just the number of triangles in your network. It's very simple. Let's assume you have three nodes, one, two, and three. And you cannot go directly from one to one. So that is not here, OK? No self-connection. But you can go directly from one to two. You can go from two to three. And you can go from three to one. And you can also go the other way. So it's symmetric, OK? That is a small network. It is also a triangle. That is also a small network. So the matrix A then, which describes what is going on here, tells you you cannot go from one to one. You cannot go from two to two. And you cannot go from three to three. But you can go otherwise. So that means you put a one here in this matrix. OK? So you can go, there's a direct link from one to two, there's a direct link from two to one, it's bidirectional, everything is fine, it's symmetric. So because it's symmetric, um, A is also symmetric. Okay, but who cares? But actually, if A is symmetric, then the eigenvalues are um, real and not really complex. This will maybe become interesting a little bit later on. But um, who also cares about that? So let's consider what actually A means. It means that there's no direct, in one hop, you cannot go from one to one, in one hop, you cannot go from two to two, and in one hop, you cannot go from three to three, but you can go, let's say, from one to two, or two to one, or one to three. And hence, there's a one, okay? So very simple. So now, let's consider the square of this guy. That gives us um, information. Can you go in two hops from one node to the other, okay? So, and we just have to multiply um, these two matrices here, which are the same. And here, just like copy and paste everything. And then the result um, needs to be computed. So how we do that? We do that looking into the book. For example, we can um, investigate what is this number here. And for that, the rule is you have to multiply 0 by 0 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1. That is a 2. So here's a 2. So this means there are two paths to go from one to one in two hops. And one path is first you go to two, then you go back to one. And the other path is first you go to three, and then you go back to one. These are, in both cases, two hops, two possibilities, hence there's a two. For example, if, if you went from one to two, and then from two to three, and three to one, that would be three hops. So that is not considered with the square of this A, OK? So and because of the symmetry, we know already that um, there are also two possible paths from two to two, and two possible paths from three to three in two hops. 
Example, let's say you want to go from three to three, that would be this number here. Then you can go first to two and then back to three, or you can go first to one and then back to three. There's no other way. So hence there's two here. So how we calculate the rest here. So let's, let's assume you want to know what this guy here is. Okay. Um, for this, we have to consider that one and here the same, it's the same rectangle here. And um, that one would be then, well, one times zero plus one times one plus zero times one. And here's also a mistake. Here's a uh, times. Okay, so that is here, then I would say one. So that is here one. So because it's here, one is everywhere else a one because of the symmetry. So then we know how this matrix looks like. Okay, so this is all of ones except for the diagonal, which is then two. But with that, we cannot really um, compute um, triangles. With triangles, what we have to do is we have to compute a to the power of three. Let's do that. So a to the power of three. Um, yeah, then we can take the two, one, 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 two, one, and one, one, two, and multiply it again with a, for example. So that means, um, for example, here, that if you want to go from one to one in three hops, there are two possibilities. So the possibility one is obviously here, here, and here. Then you have three hops and you are back to one. And here I can indicate this arrow. Or I can go the other way around. So two paths make sense. And because of symmetry, that also holds if you want to go from two to two in three hops or from three to three in three hops and so on. So hence it's diagonal. The threes come from matrix uh, multiplication. There are three possibilities to go from one to two in three hops or from two to one. Um, so what are these possibilities? So for example, in three hops, you can go to a start at one, then you go to two, then you go back to one, and then you go to two. That's are three hops. You start at one and you arrive at two. Fine. The other possibility is you go to one, you start at one, then you go to two, then you go to three, and then you go back to two. Then you also start at one and end up at two. And the third possibility is you start at one, then you go to three, then you go back to one, and then you get to two. Yeah. First from one to three, then from three back to one, and then from one to two to your destination. Check mark. That is the reason why there's a three. Now, we want to count the number of triangles, right? And you see here from the um, diagonal here, that um, we have always twos. And that means the number of paths from one node to the same node. But the triangle has three nodes, so we have to divide this number by, by three. And then we have to divide it again by two because we don't want to count the possibilities to end up in one specific node. We would just like to have the number of triangles. And as a consequence, it's just like that. The number of triangles in the graph is the sum um, of the diagonal elements. What the formula means is you have to sum up the diagonals and then divide it by six, and then you have the number of triangles. Now, so the sum, of the diagonal of some um, matrix has a name. It's called trace. Okay, so that is just a name. Nobody cares about that. And here you sum over all the elements, and it's like an n times n matrix. Not so important. What matters more, and what is more fascinating, you can show that the eigenvalues of a matrix, lambda i, um, they are connected to to this trace for matrices which um, yeah are not defective. If they are symmetric, then it always holds what I'm saying. So and the, the, the weird formula from linear algebra is that the sum of this diagonal elements of the, of uh, any matrix here any square matrix is um, actually the sum um, of its eigenvalues. Okay, for symmetric matrices, on our case, that is, that is just like the case. And from this, now we know that the sum of triangles here is just like one over six um, times the sum over these, uh, these uh, elements of the, let's say, third power of um, the, um, the adjacency uh, matrix. And as a consequence, this is just like one over six, the sum over, um, yeah, you have to sum up over the eigenvalues of the matrix uh, to the power, uh, raised to the power of three. And then there's another thing in linear algebra, which tells you, okay, so in, in that case, uh, if you want to have the eigenvalues of powers of matrices, you can just like power up the eigenvalues uh, itself. So meaning that is just like to the power of three. And this is exactly what Ernesto was referring to. And one more comment, and that is really weird because these eigenvalues here, um, they are real, um, not necessarily integer. But um, so if you sum them up like that, um, that guy is obviously an integer. So this is a connection between algebra, the area in which you are studying eigenvalues of the metric, with a combinatorial object, which is the number of triangles. Most of people, they have to count triangles and they elaborate algorithms for taking it. No, you simply take the adjacency metric, you rise to the cubic power, and you take the trace divided by six, that's the number of triangles. You can have similar formulas, which are different, but also algebraic uh, formulas with respect to summing up powers of eigenvalues with respect to other motifs, maybe to squares and stuff like that. Is that correct? Yes, because the trick is the following. If you take, if you take any power, let's say the kth power 
of the adjacent symmetry. Mm -hmm. And you take the ij entry of this kth power of the adjacent symmetry, this number is telling you the number of walks of length k between the node i and the node j. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is a walk of length three? It's just going one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. One walk of length three that goes from the same note, starting at the same note and ending at the same note, necessarily describes a triangle. So if you take the third power of the JSON symmetry and you take the main diagonal entry for the node I, this is proportional to the number of triangles in which the node I is taking place. Because you are counting close walks of length three. And this appears immediately in the solution of Altafini's dynamic system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we have three ingredients. Altafini's uh, uh, result, the, the result of the spectrum of the, of the metric, and all this connection between uh, cycles or um, suck structures and uh, eigenvalues. So I put all of this together in something I have been working and the last 10 years, which are known as metric functions. And uh, so I will not enter into the details, but uh, the metric functions uh, try to capture all the influence of all of these uh, walks, but giving more weight to the shorter than to the longer walks. So it's like, uh, okay, so you and I have to make an agreement, but also I have to make an agreement with somebody which is two steps from my side. But the agreement with somebody in the network, which is 100 steps from my side, could be very little in terms of the influence to me. So, so it's this, this short, it's this longer range interaction that, that comes then with an additional arbitrary parameter, which you tune how strong this is, sort of, or with a decay? Yeah, it, it is not completely arbitrary because it depends ah. on the metric function that you, that you select. For instance, okay. in this case, it's the exponential. So mm -hmm. you penalize by the factorial of the length of this uh, group, okay? okay? So then I put all of this together and create an index that quantify how balanced a network, a sign network is. So it goes from zero to one, okay? So if the network is balanced, you have one. If the network is absolutely non-balanced, which is just asymptotically the case, so it means it is a kind of hypothetical infinite kind of uh, graph. Uh, then you have zero. And then you have all the spectrum in the middle. Mm -hmm. So now we can calculate this index for whatever network you want. So the first thing I did was taking some very small networks that you can visualize, that you can understand, and that you can uh, immediately figure out. I, I send you the picture. This is the degree of balance of the several alliance and, uh, let's say, enmities that were in Europe since 1872 to 1907. So we have five, no, six powers. So France, Great Britain, Russia, Germany, the Austro-Hungarian uh, Empire, mm -hmm. and Italy. So in 1872 to 81, uh, we have the so-called Three Emperors League in which we have uh, a triple uh, alliance between uh, Germany, Russia, and the uh, Austri Austria-Hungary Empire, and an enmity with all the others except with Italy that was not participating in anything. So then we have not balance at all there. So we have poor balance, let's say 0 0.5. I don't have the number. Then in 1882, we have the triple alliance, and then in the triple alliance, we have a little bit more of uh, alliance here. And the degree of balance increased a little bit. It dropped again during the German-Russian lapse uh, in 1890. And it go a little bit up during the French-Russian alliance in 1891. And then uh, in 1904, we have the Entente Cordiale, which is the, the most famous. I studied in the school, the Entente Cordiale. And then during the Entente Cordiale, the balance was about 0.5, okay? But then in 1907, we have the British-Russian alliance. And what happens here? We have 
friendship or alliance between France, Great Britain, and Russia. The three form uh, alliance between them. And then we have another group of alliance between Germany, Austro-Hungarian, and Italy. The three form a triangle of positive relations, but they were enemy between the two blocks. So what we really have is this situation here in which we have two blocks of perfectly positive uh, allies, which are enemies between them. And this continue for many other years, but what happened in 1914? We had the First World War. Hey, Germany, we're going to declare war on Serbia, and Germany is all for that. So Austria-Hungary send a big list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refuses, they declare war. Austria-Hungary and Germany are friends, and Serbia is protected by Russia, who's friends with France, so they'll declare war on each other. Montenegro joins in too. France and Britain also have a kind of alliance, so when France says, Hey, Britain, you got my back? Britain is like, maybe. And I am not saying it's a consequence of that, but what we have here are two well-balanced blocks that were strong enough as to be confronted to each other. A situation that was not in any of the other cases before 1907. Mm -hmm. You have a lack of balance. So the first thing that I was thinking is, okay, maybe balance is not so good as Haider was saying. Then I go to, I went to the, this uh, big online social networks, uh, the case of recommendation in films, and then I found a completely contradictory result respect to what was published before in the literature. I found that the networks were very, very, very far from balance, and I was in despair. I was in despair because I say nobody will publish and nobody will believe in my result because they are against Hyder and they are against the previously published results. And what, what, what data was that specifically? Was it like IMDb? Uh, it, was a, it was a recommendation. It was, a, I have here in the paper, the title of the, of the, mm -hmm. of the database. It, it was a big data set from what? Yeah, it was, this was 200,000 uh, yeah. people. Okay. And, uh, and then for the Wikipedia, it was about 10,000 people. And there was another uh, a third network as well. So the degree of balance changed, but they were far from balance. Mm -hmm. So what is the solution when you are in this uh, puzzle? Go to the source. So I book, I, I book the, the, the book of Heider, 1948, and I read completely the book. And in no place, Heider was saying, that the natural evolution of the systems was toward balance. Indeed, there is a paragraph which I copy into the paper in which he says, he wrote that maybe a balanced state was a boring state. Mm -hmm. Maybe people try to escape from balance because this represents a kind of evolution, a kind of dialectical evolution in, in the state of the, of the system. So, uh, okay, so we have something uh, to, to battle. And then I found that other authors have analyzed the uh, evolution of the international relations in the world uh, since uh, 1938 uh, until current days. And this is important, I will say that uh, and some of the slides I, I send you, uh, there is a database uh, created by an historian from uh, uh, an American university. And uh, he collected information about all the major conflicts in the world since the 19th century until today. And uh, the database contains a lot of information. So you can spend hours if you are not careful and then you diverge to many different things because it contained information, how many uh, people were uh, uh, confronting to each other, how many tanks, how many, whatever. Mm -hmm. So uh, then I, I asked him for some, for some data and uh, some uh, researchers uh, have found that the system uh, 
the, the world was not going toward balance in international relation as predicted by Hyde. And uh, this was published in the uh, social science uh, literature by important authors. So I took this data set and I analyzed it by using my balance index. Then I, you have this, this picture here, yes. uh, the second one here. Mm -hmm. And uh, this picture reveals something dramatic. So the first thing is that the largest balance that I obtained for the whole period between 1935 until 2008 was for 1935, 1936. Uh, and the balance was almost one. Mm -hmm. Balance was about 0 0.8, 0 0.9. So we know what happened in 1939, Second World War start. During the Second World War, the balance dropped almost to zero. So you can here see this is balance, and here you have the Second World War. The balance dropped to almost zero. So then in the 1945, 1946, the balance went up to about 0.5. But then we had, again, the Korean War in 1952, and the balance dropped to below 0 0.1. Then in the 1950s, the balance went up to the second highest value, almost 0 0.6. And then we had the Vietnam War in the 1960s, where the balance dropped to about 0 0.1. Then it went up. Then we have the Iraq-Iran war. Then it went up. We have the Gulf War. Then it went up. Then we have the Yugoslavian wars and so forth. So in general, we have a trend, not very marked, but a trend to unbalance. And this doesn't mean it's bad because we know that possibly being in a balanced state is worse than being in an unbalanced state. So finally, I, I want to mention uh, the, the, the last example is from uh, the tribes, Gahukugama, uh, which is in a, in a region of Papua New Guinea. The island of New Guinea consists of two countries. This is often misunderstood. Papua New Guinea lies on the east of the island, and it's an independent country, and it's a country in its own right and on the west of the island is part of Indonesia. New Guinea as an island is by far, hands down, the most culturally diverse place on earth. Nowhere else really even comes close. Papua New Guinea, the independent country in the east of the island, has over 850 languages just on its own. And there are at least another 270 languages on the western half of the island, which is part of Indonesia. So we're talking, what, the best part of, what, over 1,200 languages on this incredible island which is just off the chart. It's pretty amazing. One of the reasons why this, is so, this island is so culturally diverse and just so rich with, with culture and languages is because it has very abrupt topography. And each valley harbored its own communities and it's often its own languages. And tribal boundaries were very distinct and discreet. Many of the tribes would fiercely fight any other tribes that came into their valley or into their territories. In our Western culture, we hide away from death. We, we're afraid of seeing dead people. You don't really see dead people unless in a, a morgue briefly before they're buried. Well, in other cultures, it's the exact polar opposite. And here in New Guinea, particularly here in Ezeki, um, death is not something that they hide away from. Uh, they, they don't regard death in the same way that we do. When someone dies, the bodies were traditionally smoked and put on cliff sides as guardians of the village. It's actually quite sweet when you think about it. They guard the village and protect and look over and watch over uh, the, the tribe and the, and the, and the culture. It's, it's not to be feared. And so whenever you want to, you can visit your grandma on, a, on, a, on the cliff and talk to her. And now we're off back into the highlands of New Guinea to meet some of the highland tribes, which are very, very special. One of the most famous highland tribes are the Huli Wigmen. This is in Ulia village, uh, not far from Mount Hagen. The Huli Wigmen are one of the most spectacular of all of New Guinea's many tribes. Um, they adorn their faces with these beautiful uh, paints. Uh, they, uh, they adorn their, their bodies with oil and often red. And most, most significantly, they have these spectacular wigs made out of human hair, uh, often adorned with lots of different birds of paradise feathers. You can see here the Ragiana bird of paradise, these orange feathers here. 
and the cravat of the um, of the superb bird of paradise here at the front, and they make these beautiful jumping dancers, singing and moving up and down at, at the same time. Here's some of them here about to perform their drum dances. They're very, very spectacular, and I, one of the tribes that I love the most. They're very interesting to see. And this yellow coloration in particular is very important for their tribe. It's one of their, their tribal colours. You'll notice around this, this gentleman's neck, he's got cowrie shells that have been traded with the lowlands, and cassowary quills. Those black things are, are coiled quills of the cassowaries, um, which are very significant through, through much of the highlands and very important. Here's one of the birds that they use for, um, for those feathers for their headdresses. This is the Ragiana bird of paradise uh, for those beautiful orange, orange feathers for the middle of their, their wigs. That's one of the Ragianas actually um, sitting in a palm. And the superb bird of paradise with that incredible iridescent uh, cravat there, which they use often at the fronts of their wigs. Okay, we're also in the Highlands. We're going to look at another incredible tribe. And his, his, head, his headdress is often made with, with um, cassowary. These are cassowary feathers here at the top. They're, they're affixed by a resin onto breastplates, and they'll wear them very, very proudly. Um, here's a wig woman, a Hagen wig woman, with these beautiful face paints and shell, shell necklaces. Um, so these, the, the mud men are very famous for producing spectacular noises. Chimbu skeleton men, um, through her hair, as you can see here, and beautiful a kina shell, a carved kina shell around her neck. Once a, once a year, they'll go back to the cave. The skeleton men are inside the cave, all the way inside in the darkness. And they'll come out and perform their scary spirit dance, pretending to be or invoking the spirits of those skeletons. The tribes are in the, in the forest, and they are mainly hunters and collectors. And uh, there are small rivers and there are, um, the forest is going to the top of the, of the place. And there are a few, uh, a few tribes in the, in the forest. And there are a few tribes which are below the, the forest. So many other people have found that this uh, network is not balanced. Uh, there is a very despective, uh, I could say despective way of referring to these uh, group, uh, social groups there by a British uh, sociologist who says that uh, they looks like uh, their entertainment was war. Uh, it was not entertaining, of course, uh, it was a necessity. And, uh, but they were at war uh, during, during uh, long periods. Mm -hmm. And if you analyze the network, you understand why they, they were at war. Back then, the warriors burnt it so their enemies couldn't hide. And nor could we. I was here filming the fighting until it got too dangerous. Get down, get down. Because the, the tribes at the, below the forest need to go to the forest for their resources. There were the places for hunting and collecting food there. But there were other tribes there. So they were fighting for that. And then when you analyze the balance, what you see is that they are out of balance, but then you can split more or less into two disjoint groups, one in the forest, the others in the forest, there were enmity between people in the forest as well, yes. There were a few enmities between people outside the forest, but the biggest enmities were people in the forest, people outside the forest. Mm -hmm. So if you want to avoid this war, you have now a reason why they are fighting. It's for resources. Just give some kind of path to the people outside the forest, to resources in the forest, deviate some part of the resource that people are using in the forest to these other people and you have without uh, let's say making a harder negotiation you influence the level of balance of this of this network and mm -hmm. and this is uh, the, the kind of work i i did in in this so there were two papers the second is in the mathematics literature which is this one i was mentioning the first was more in the in the physics one but yeah it's it's a kind of work I am very happy with. So do you know when the next big war happened? You know, the only predictions in history which are very confident are the predictions about the past. And uh, not, not always uh, they are precise. Sometimes you make mistakes. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so what, what I observe 
and, and this is an empirical observation, is that the periods between wars were periods of, of high balance. Of course, the, the war has changed in many aspects as well. So now the wars are, are, are different as well. And, and there are other battlefields as well. So these are, let's say, alliance and enmities mainly between countries and uh, mainly declared kind of uh, enmities and things like that. But now there are many commercial battles. Uh, there are many internet battles, which are not taken into account in the recent years here. So it could be interesting to analyze this, this kind of uh, new data. So we are, for instance, collaborating with uh, other people and analyzing the voting uh, in the European Parliament. And it's, it's, it's very nice, it's very nice results because mm -hmm. you typically see the split between uh, red and blue. So let's say progressist uh, kind of uh, parties and more conservative kind of parties. Uh, but there are some kind of issues that when goes to the European Parliament, they interest not in these two blocks, but interest in completely different ways. And then the balance of the system, which has kept for many boring or not necessarily so important voting, is completely destroyed. Mm -hmm. And the network become unbalanced. Mm -hmm. So this unbalance possibly is the state of saying, OK, so here we abandoned the position of other parties in my same block because I have to defend the interests of the people I really represent. And possibly these are, as Haider says, more interesting states from a sociological point of view, because the other states are a little bit boring, at least from a mathematical point of view. Mm -hmm. so you have this split of the network and, and kind of things. Mm -hmm. There are many conflicts which are not wars. So, and um, that is also a matter of what you just said, a matter of conflicts. And the question is, do you have data for that? And maybe, Let's say if there's a war in Latin America, this does not necessarily mean that you see it if you look at in data in Australia or something like that. So it always has to cover. Um, so the parties which form this network have to be like um, part of the, of the conflict, obviously. So you have like univariate variable, either plus or minus, but you could also have like different kinds of balances, for example, financial or political interests or interest in one specific thing, let's say oil or interest in, in order to get rid of some uh, spreading disease or something like that, which some um, countries may have, other maybe have have other priorities. So if you have like more um, attributes like on, on a link, is there also some theory, some mathematics, or can you say something about that? Or is it just like, okay, that is then too much, that, that cannot be really analyzed? No, 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 it can, it can. Uh, indeed, for the case of the, uh, first, uh, let me mention, because uh, I think uh, it deserves to be mentioned. So the, the database uh, that I was uh, mentioning before for historic, uh, data about conflict is uh, created by Seth Maoth. I don't know if I am pronouncing correctly. This uh, database contains many different kinds of conflict, not only army conflict. Sometimes are alliance, strategic alliance. Sometimes are disagreement uh, between uh, countries and, and things like that. So what you say is very important. And uh, uh, we, we move from the case of the sign network to assign multiplex, for instance, yeah. which you have different kind of layers of uh, interest. And, uh, and, 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 and in this particular scenario, what you can have is a more complicated uh, situation, but it's also treatable by the same theory. So, you know, mathematicians like to uh, go a little bit ahead of, of the data. And then I, I have developed the, the mathematical theory already for analyzing these kind of things in multiplexes. Because it, it is mathematically elegant that you can define some kind of uh, geometry uh, of these conflicts and things like that. So uh, we have developed it. But I, I could be very, very happy if uh, other researchers uh, listening to your podcast, hey, I, I, I have some kind of data and I would like to analyze this data with your approach. So I could be very happy to to help in this direction. But yes, the, the, the future uh, of these approaches is to go beyond this uh, simple zero one uh, or one minus one approaches to go to multi-layer or to weighted kind of uh, situations. For the case of the voting, 
we have the probability because we have the frequency between which two members of the European Parliament vote in favor or against uh, the same law. And, uh, and then you can assign probability. So you have not uh, plus or uh, minus one, but you have plus or minus a real number there. So, but the, the theory is the same. This, the theory, even if, the, if you have directions in the, in the edges, if you have multiplexes, uh, you can generalize to other more complicated uh, scenarios like simplicial complexes, etc. Uh, but yes, so that's, that's the future. So, this was part three of my podcast with Ernesto Estrada. Thanks for watching and thanks Ernesto for this three hours marathon. <laughs>